Okay, so today and on Monday and Wednesday, we'll be looking at um, Putnam's way of developing the theory of reference. Um, and then we'll go on to Evans. Um, uh, so the basic question that Putnam is using to frame the discussion in meaning and reference is, do our psychological states fix the references of our terms? And as I said in the, for, in the very first lecture we had, that's the natural way to think about language, that it's what's in your mind, it's what's in your head, that is breathing life into the signs of the language. It's what's in your head that is making the whole thing go, that is making the language, making that system of signs into a representational system in the first place. So if that's your head, then the question is, is what's in your head fixing reference? And if you think of it in terms of sense or descriptions or clusters of descriptions, then it seems like, well, the sense or a cluster of descriptions, that's something that you grasp with your mind. Um, that's something that you know about. Uh, so the general question is, just for the people who came in just a second ago, the general question is, um, do our psychological states fix the references of our terms? Um, and if uh, what's in your head is a sense or a description fixing the reference, well, it looks like that description must, that's something you know about, that's something in your mind. Um, and uh, that thing there, the intermediary that is fixing the reference of the term, you do know, you, you do grasp that. So that's going to be fixing reference. So it looks like on the classic uh, frege Serle kind of picture, the answer to this should be yes, your psychological state is fixing the reference of your term. It's a little bit different if you have a causal theory where you do without the uh, sense or description um, and you just have a causal chain because the causal chain between you and your surroundings, that's not itself on the face of it something interior to your mind, right? That's the, the causal chain is something about the relation between your mind and the environment. So uh, on a causal uh, chain kind of picture of reference, it looks like the answer to this question should be no. It is not your psychological state that's fixing the reference of your terms. There's a sense in which we're not really in charge of the way our language works. Um, uh, rather, it's the causal connections between us and the environment that are shaping what we say and think. Um, and uh, uh, it's not something that we just lay down. There's nothing conventional about the existence of a causal chain. It's not a convention of human language. That's just the way the thing works. Um, it's not up to us. So that's the kind of framing question in Putnam's discussion. Is what's interior to your head, is your psychological state, what's fixing the references of your terms? And he's got this, um, well, let's just think about the characterization of what a psychological state is. And he's got this famous example of twin earth that we'll spend most time on today. Um, so what's your psychological state? Your psychological state is something that's independent of your relations to your surroundings. If for anyone who's done Descartes, this goes right back to the idea, well, it might all be a dream. It might all be hallucinations. Um, I might just be sitting by the fire thinking I'm giving a lecture. I might be fast asleep at home thinking I've made it to the lecture on time. You might be just fast asleep at home thinking that you made it to the lecture on time. Um, um, but your, your internal psychological state could be just the same. Even if you were a brain in a vat, your internal psychological state could be just the same. So your surroundings cause you to have different psychological states. But what the straits are intrinsically, that has to do only with you. One way to think of this is in terms of your knowledge of your own psychological states. I mean, the way Descartes put it, I mean, I guess most of you know Descartes, uh, have come across Descartes' meditations, I think therefore I am and all that stuff, at, at some point, dear old Descartes. Um, well, the, the way he was thinking of it was, uh, my knowledge of the physical world, that might all be a dream, that might not really be happening, 
Um, but I can survey the contents of my own mind. I can just look inside my own mind and see there what is going on. So you have this domain of your own psychological states over which you really have this special authority. And whether or not you're dreaming, whether or not there's anything out there, you know what's going on in your own mind. And that's not just your own mind at the moment. I mean, presumably, that would apply to your memory of your mental states yesterday. Um, and maybe what was going on yesterday was all a dream, but you still know what was going on in your mind yesterday. If your memory is working, then uh, you still know what was going on inside your own mind, even if independently of what your relations were to your surroundings at any point. So Putnam's twin earth example is meant to challenge this kind of idea. Um, so the twin earth example is, well, imagine that far, far away in a distant galaxy, there is a solar system just like this one. Um, uh, an earth just like this one. Um, a US, a California, a Berkeley, just like this one. And there, there is um, a counterpart of Wheeler Hall and a lecture room just like this one, full of bright, eager faces, thirsting for knowledge, um, just like this one. Um, and as you can see, um, twin Earth is very like Earth. I mean, really, the, uh, it's very hard to tell them apart. Um, it's except for one crucial detail, it's exactly like Earth. I mean, if you want to take a moment, you should check it out. I mean, can you see any difference? No, they really are very, very similar. Yes? Ah, ah, you're reading the caption. But <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well done. <laughs> okay. Um, so you can, but uh, with that small detail, let's say you can see they're very, very similar. So you have got a double on twin earth. Your double right at the moment is molecule for molecule identical to you. Uh, you raise your hand, your double raises their hand. You feel thirsty, your double feels thirsty. Okay, molecule for molecule, they're exactly the same, with some crucial differences. Now, suppose that um, we swapped you in and out for your double. Would you notice? Suppose that right at the moment, we can zap you into the seat of your double, if you see what I mean. We swap you out. Would you even notice what was going on? Okay. Is your psychological state the same as that of your double? Well, sure it is. Right? What would the difference be? If you were swapped, being swapped in and out, you wouldn't tell any difference. Nobody could tell any difference. If you've got a headache, your double's got a headache. If you're feeling puzzled, your double's... If you're feeling suspicious, <laughs> your, your double's feeling suspicious. Yes? Okay. Um, so that's it for Twin Earth. We'll come on. We'll, we'll develop the point a little bit further. So on uh, in, a, in a moment. But um, the key point is there's that notion of psychological state where even though um, you, you and your twin are in quite different places, surrounded by quite different people and objects, what's going on with the two of you internally is exactly the same. What's going on in your mind is exactly the same. That's the first key point. Your mind and that of your twin, there's no difference between them. Are we all happy with that? Comfortable with that? Okay. Well, here is the one key difference between Earth and Twin Earth. On Twin Earth, there is a liquid that fills the lakes and rivers that fall from the sky. Uh, it looks just like water, but it's not water. It's um, not H2O. It's uh, got a very long and complicated formula, which um, for technical reasons I won't go into exactly what, what, what it is, but we abbreviate it as X, Y, Z. 
Okay. So at normal temperatures and pressures, um, H2O and XYZ are indistinguishable. You only see, really see the difference between them showing up when you heat them to something like the temperature of the sun or freeze them to absolute zero. You don't, you don't really notice any difference regularly. All right with that? So although you and your twin are molecule for molecule identical, your you, the, the liquid circulating through you is different, but um, the, uh, that difference doesn't show up uh, in the, uh, in the beha chemical behavior of the thing. So you're still psychologically identical, you and your twin. Yep. It does make you not molecule for molecule identical, but what I'm suggesting is that that difference doesn't show up at normal temperatures and pressures in the behavior of the substance. So you're still going to be psychologically identical. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. Yes? No, see, at, at normal temperatures and pressures, XYZ is just the same as H2O. The chemical reactions are just the same at normal temperatures and pressures. I mean, it, it would take me too far into advanced chemistry to really explain how, <laughs> how this works. Yeah. If you really badger me about this, <laughs> then um, we can make it so that in twin earth, um, there really is some H2O, but it's confined. No, actually, it's too complicated. <laughs> the, if we drained you or me, of X Y of water of H two O and pumped in a whole bunch of X Y Z, you wouldn't notice any difference. Yeah, nobody would notice any difference. A normal temperature. I mean, unless we heated you to the temperature of the sun. Uh, you, you see what I mean? I mean, <laughs> I know that you guys are not chemistry majors, so stop me if this is getting too technical. Is is? You see the scenario. Okay. Um, so if you look at a high school on um, uh, Twin Earth, and you're asked, they're being taught about the evaporation precipitation, uh, the evaporation condensation precipitation cycle, it looks just like the one here, right? This is very, very similar to the kind of diagram um, people, high school students on Earth get. Um, uh, but this is what they get in on uh, Twin Earth. So the water was working in the environment. I mean, the, the XYZ is working in the environment in just the way that the H2O does here. Do you want to take a moment to digest that? Okay. Um, so here's Putnam. X, oh, actually, here he is saying it. XYZ is indistinguishable from water at normal temperatures and pressures. See, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, the oceans and lakes and seas of Twin Earth contain XYZ and not water. It rains X, Y, Z and twin earth and not water and so on. So if you take a typical, I mean, this is an actual uh, shot of twin earth. Um, you can see, <laughs> that, <laughs> you can see that it looks very, very similar to um, a rainstorm over water on, uh, on our earth. You see the similarity? I mean, it's, uh, you can really tell the difference with the, the naked eye. Okay. so. What's going on is that um, we have a substance uh, which we assume has some particular underlying structure, but we might not know what it is, but we say it behaves in these ways. It participates in the, um, I mean, you find it in all the rivers and lakes and so on. You see that it's uh, uh, evaporating from the seas and um, forming into clouds and then blown about and precipitated again. You see it's behaving in all those ways. You see it dissolves stuff that plants needed to live, that you and I needed to live. So there are all these behaviors of the substance. And you assume that there's some kind of underlying molecular or whatever structure that the thing has that is explaining that behavior of the substance. Yep? Is, 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 I, I, I could elaborate on that point, on that idea a little bit, but is, is that plain enough just the way I've said it? So this, it's not plain enough? It is plain, okay. Oh. <laughs> 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 
Okay, okay, come back to it. When you see what happens, come back and tell me why you don't believe it. Okay. Um, so on Earth, what we find out is that the structure underlying these behaviours of the substance is none other than H2O. And at that point, it's a discovery that water is H2O. It's a discovery that gold is the stuff with atomic number 79. These are all chemical discoveries. The names of the substances were known for centuries before the actual um, underlying structure was found. But when you say water is H2O, that is uh, our old friend and informative identity. Right? You're saying it's one and the same stuff, water and the H2O. You found that out. It wasn't a priori. It wasn't just something you made up. It wasn't just something you stipulated or laid down. You found that out. So on Earth, I mean, we were using the word water for centuries before we knew anything about um, molecular composition. So when you learn that water is H2O, that's a discovery. You're finding out what the word water stood for all along. Yeah, you're finding out what that substance really is. So in Twin Earth, what goes on is that they have a substance with very similar behaviors to our substance. So the S1, S2, S3, S4 here are all just exactly the same. And they assume there's some underlying molecular structure here. But when they find out that, uh, uh, that the molecular composition is XYZ, they say their informative identity is water is XYZ. For them, they say well, well, that's how they put it. Um, and when they say that, that's a discovery. They're finding out what the word stood for all along. They've not just stipulated this. They're finding out an empirical fact about their surroundings that they're expressing by saying water is X, Y, Z. OK? So you and your twin, the points you've got to so far, you and your twin have exactly the same psychological states. Um, but you, you, when that moment of revelation comes, will say, um, uh, water is H2O. Your twin will say, water is XYZ. Yep. OK. Um, here's Putnam's way of expounding the idea. For every world, one way you could understand the meaning of water is to say, well, if you take uh, if you put it in terms of possible worlds, then take any possible world. What is the word um, water? What does our word water refer to relative to some other possible world? Suppose you said, had there been water on the moon, there would have been lots of life in the moon. Um, what substance are you talking about then in that counterfactual situation? Are you talking about H2O, XYZ, something else? Yeah, I mean, that's my hunch, that whatever counterfactual you express using water, you're talking about H2O. Yeah. So one way, th th this is a little bit like this debate we were having about the strangler. One way you could hear the word water is as standing for a kind of role that a thing can play. So you could say, well, there's the stuff that plays the watery role on Earth, and the stuff that plays the watery role on twin Earth. Yeah. So you could say, here is the local water about the stuff in Twin Earth. And you could say, well, um, uh, had there been water in the moon, it would actually have been XYZ, because the moon doesn't contain enough hydrogen and oxygen to make regular water, let's suppose. You see what I mean? But the way you guys have just expounded it, and I actually agree, that's, n that's not how we operate in practice. We think something like this. It's not that... Um, whatever world you're in, water is the stuff that um, is chemically similar to the stuff that's playing the watery role. So the idea expressed here is you point to the stuff that's filling the rivers and lakes and falling from the skies, and you say, I'll call that anything that fills that role water. Yeah. And anything that's chemically similar to it is water. And that chemically similar notion is going to be something that science explains for you ultimately when it gets to 
down to the nitty-gritty in phase well. Uh, we're talking about molecules here. Um, so this way of putting it would be to say water is like a flexible designator. Yeah, it's, it's like a description specifying a role. Whatever stuff plays the watery role. But you guys are saying um, uh, that it's something different is going on. What you're saying is um, for every world, W, when we're talking about some counterfactual situation, when you ask, when you say, had there been water on the moon, what you're saying is uh, we're talking about stuff that is chemically similar to whatever it is in the actual world that plays the watery role. Yeah, so this is one of these descriptions with an actually in it. Uh -huh. So is this, reading it this way, is this rigid or flexible? Very good. Any votes for flexible? Okay. Because in order to find out what substance it's referring to in any world, you have to keep tracking back to the actual world and looking at what's playing the watery role in the actual world. Um, so that's um, really kind of intuitive. Um, suppose you ask, is it necessary that water is the stuff that fills the rivers and lakes, falls from the sky, quenches thirst, and so on? Is that necessary? Yes. yes? So in every possible world, that's true? Aha, uh -huh. yes, that's, that's very good, actually. A priori, yeah, but is, is it necessary? That's to say, look at, look at, meditate in all those worlds, right? There's a lot of them. In every single world, is it water uh, that is filling the watery role? Yeah? Sorry? Yes. It's what? Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I actually agree. I think you're right about the a priori. But if you think, well, the reference is being specified by whatever it is in the actual world that fills that role. So there could be another possible world. I mean, there is another possible world in which something else fills that role. Yeah? I mean, after all, it could have been that all the H2O got drained out of um, the rivers and lakes here. Could have been. And that some um, benevolent aliens filled up the planet with uh, X, Y, Z. We should do just as well. Had that happened, it would have been something else that was filling the watery role that was... Um, so it wouldn't be... In that case, it wouldn't have been water that filled the rivers and lakes. Watch me very closely here. So this is necessary. Sorry, this is not necessary. That's all right. If I'm explaining this correctly, it should really be pretty easy. Is this all right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not necessary, that. Um, because there could be ringers for water. There could be stuff that looked like water but wasn't water, right? And, I mean, I, I began by explaining this in a way that's kind of chemically very implausible. But, really, for most kind of substances, th this is just the general point. There could be ringers. There could be lookalikes. And most things are like that. Wood is like that. There could be a lookalike for wood. Um, most animal species are like that. There could be lookalikes for tigers. Um, most chemical substances are like that. There could be lookalikes for most chemical substances. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you can have lookalikes, that's to say, there could be something else filling that role. So it's not necessary that uh, whatever the role is of the chemical or animal or whatever, it's, uh, it's not necessary that that animal is filling that role. Um, on the other hand, is it necessary that water is H2O? Yes. What a good class. Yeah, right, right. It is, well, I mean, on the, on the story I'm telling anyhow, it is necessary that water is H2O. Why is that? Well, because in any possible world, in any possible world in which you want to find out what water stands for in this world, you just keep having to track back to the actual world and find out what the term stands for and what substance the term stands for in the actual world. And in the actual world, what we happen to know is that it's H2O. Yeah? Um, I know what H2O is water and not Uh, 
How is that a priori? Um, I, I don't think I exp I, I, I've addressed that yet. I haven't addressed that yet. I do think it's a priori. Oh, yes, I, I said in, comment, uh, in reply to his question that it was a priori. Let me, give me just a second. Right. Yeah. Because I, I agree it needs some explanation. Okay. okay. Um, and the intuitive idea here is that what makes H2O, what makes water the stuff it is, is the essence of water is whatever explains its characteristic behavior. If you ask what makes us say that um, the atomic number of an element is essential to it, is that the atomic number of the element explains why the element behaves the way it does. So the essence of a thing is whatever makes it behave in just the way it does. So it's because uh, all the chemical substances have their particular atomic or molecular constitutions. That's what makes them behave the way they do. That's what makes them have the um, uh, temperatures of boiling or freezing, for example, that they do. Uh, so in general, the essence is what makes a chemical substance the chemical substance it is. Um, it doesn't make sense to say I could have the same chemical substance, but a different molecular composition or a different atomic number. Um, so, although looking at this, you guys might say, look, water might be a rigid designator, but what about the H2O? Isn't that a description? Yes? I mean, it's describing it has whatever it is, um, two hydrogen atoms to one oxygen atom. Yeah. It's nonetheless a description that's really basic because it's specifying the essence of the substance is specifying a characteristic the substance couldn't but have. So it is actually rigid. In any world in which you've got H2O, it's the same substance. H2O is not a flexible designator. So we think of it like that. H2O is the essence of water. But this last question, is it a priori that water fills the rivers and lakes, falls from the sky, quenches thirst, and so on? How about that? It's not a priori. You said a minute ago it was a priori. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not trying to catch you out. <laughs> I just wish, <laughs> I'm just surprised. Um, okay, yeah. Um, are, you, are you talking about water as an XYZ or are you talking about water as an H2O? I'm, talk I'm just talking about what on earth we mean when we say water. What we mean when in, in regular English we say water. That's very good. You do, you, you do need experience to understand what the term is. Yeah, that's right. The way you would explain to someone what water is is by showing them some. Yeah. Um, but in general, remember, with an a priori truth, you often need some experience to know what the concept is. Yeah. So if I show you the colors, you need some experience of the colors to know what they are. That's all right. But still, consider oranges in between uh, red and yellow. That's, not, that's an a priori truth. If you understand the concept, then you know, then you know the thing is true. Uh, yes? I think, if I followed you, I think that's completely correct, yes. Um, so one way you could think of it is, remember Bright being the inventor of the wheel? Remember our old friend Bright? 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 Dear old Bright. Um, okay, was it a priori that Bright invented the wheel? Yes, it was a priori that Bright invented the wheel. Remember the strangler? Was it a priori that the strangler committed all those murders? Yes, right? Um, so what you do there is, 
you specify a role uh, and you say whoever's filling th that role in the actual world, that's who I'm talking about. But then it's a priori that in the actual world, that person is filling that role. It's not necessary, but it's a priori. Yep. This might be what? This might be complicated, but... Um, oh, unlike the, what I've said so far, right? So, <laughs> okay. it's not necessary, as you were saying, in all possible worlds. Uh, that's right. And our world is one of those possible worlds. That's right. But it seems like the only reason it's necessary for us to have a specific role in the world is because we need to specify that we're thinking about water from the context of this world. So, Very good. necessary facts in the context of climate, which it seems like it shouldn't be that's very good. So you, you're saying it, it, there's some sense in which it's only an accident that the A is hung on this world. Yeah. Yeah. If the A were hung on that world. Then you would be saying water is XYZ. Necessary. That's right. Okay. So um, l l l let me diagram this. Th th this is very good. So um, what I've been doing so far is I've been saying let's assume that the actual, that the actual world is one with the A on it and we don't consider any possibility of variation here, right? And everything I've been saying is completely correct, right? You're not challenging that. Um, uh, so long as um, we've got the actual world fixed and static, and then we say, what's going on in all these other worlds? So the only variation we consider is which of these worlds we're considering relative to this as the actual world. But this actually bears on... Um, uh, Ah, ah, right, right, <laughs> okay. Um, this being a priori, the water fills the rivers and lakes. Whichever world we're in, uh, we don't really know a priori which world we're in. We don't know for an a priori if we were in an H2O world or an XYZ world. But what we do is we use the word water to stand for whatever it is that in the actual world is filling that um, watery role. Yeah? That's, that's okay, I can put it like that. Um, so then you know that, well, uh, uh, if in the actual world, if this world is the actual world, then uh, water fills the rivers and lakes, falls from the sky, quenches thirst and so on. But had the A been hung in a quite different world, had the A been hung on an XYZ world, water would still be filling the rivers and lakes, falling from the sky, quenching thirst and so on. Had it been... Uh, uh, um, a DEF world, yeah? water would still be filling the rivers and lakes falling from the sky and so on. And um, had it been um, an H, well, you see, you see what I mean, an HIJ world, right? It doesn't matter which world is actual. Whichever world is the actual one, water is still filling the rivers and lakes falling from the sky, quenching thirst and so on. So it's always coming out true that that's how come it's a priori. Because you don't have to look to see which world is actual in order to know that it's true. Yep. So I agree with you. I think it is easier because we define water as a thing that fills the rivers and lakes each other. So right. So now it's being contingent that it needs to be right. Right. There's, well, the thing, uh, yeah, uh, there's a sense in which it is contingent that it's H2O. Right? Um, that water is H2O is not true in the actual world, whichever world is actual. Take this thing here, water fills the rivers and lakes and so on, all right? Now, you can if you just watch what happens here. Look, you can hang the A on lots of different worlds, right? And whichever, it doesn't matter which world you hang the A on, that's true, yeah? That's how come it's a priori. Water is H2O, that's not that doesn't stay true when you move the A around. You can see that. Yes? Water is H2O changes its truth value if you move the A around. Yeah. Um, so it's not true in the actual world, no matter which world is actual. Yeah. So that's what you mean when you say it's not necessary. So I agree, that's a sense of necessary, right? But that's not the definition that we're working with of necessary. The definition of necessary under which it is necessary is to say, suppose you fix the actual world, is it then true in every possible world? And it is. 
So given that the actual world is an H2O world, it's necessary that water is H2O. But what happens is that as you move around, um, the actual world casts its shadow over all the other possible worlds. You see what I mean? So that if the actual world is um, an XYZ world, then it's necessary that water is XYZ. It's true in every other world that water is XYZ. Yeah. So there's a sense in which it's necessary, namely given which world is actual, it's true in all possible worlds. Okay, things are hotting up. One, two, three. <laughs> Yes, that's very good. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly the idea. Yeah. Okay, so if we fix water in the actual world, that's yeah. necessary, right? That's right. So then what happens if there are eight water things that water is filled with in other In every other yeah. So yeah. when we go to other worlds, we still have that necessary identity of water in each world. But all of a sudden the Yep. Here and the necessary water, the necessary identity on the world is water. I'm not dead sure I understand the question. Let me say, I'll say something, but okay. but then come back and, and see if I've got it. Okay. Uh, tell me what I haven't got it. Okay. So, um, what I say we know uh, a priori is that is this, yeah, yeah. Um, and. Uh, the, the way that this reference is being fixed as is as whatever actually fills that role. Right. Yeah. So if we assume it's H2O that is actually filling that role, yeah. then relative to that, in every other possible world, water is H2O. Right. right? I, I, there's a simple disconnect. There, there is a disconnect, but that's because they have two different notions of necessity. Right. Um, one is keep the actual world fixed, and then look at what happens in every possible world. The other is, only look at what goes on in the actual world, but consider varying which world is actual. No, this is, sorry, I, I'm not exp No, I shouldn't worry. <laughs> Every step here is individually very straightforward, so if it seems complicated, it's because I'm not explaining it correctly. You, uh, you see what I mean? But okay. let, let, let's come back to this, yeah. uh, or come at it from a different angle. Yeah. I, I, think, I feel like this is a second most interesting process. I was wondering what constitutes the actual world. Like, what is the actual world? Like, what, what constitutes the essence of a thing? Right. right. Um, it seems like, you know, water fills the river, and it flows over. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, that would be going too far to say that whatever is actual is, is true in all possible worlds, right? That would just obliterate the, the distinction between the necessary and the contingent. Um, but when you say what motivates the essentialism here, um, I, I'm not quite sure. It, 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 suppose you think about names of diseases, yeah, diseases, where with a disease you have a certain batch of symptoms that you associate with the disease. And then you say, but of course you can have a disease without showing any of the symptoms. Or you can show the symptoms but not have the disease. Then, then we think, well, what it is to have the disease really is having the virus, yep. The, 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 that notion of the underlying thing that is explaining the usual car outward characteristics of the thing, 
But that's the notion of essence here. I, I, I'm not sure I have a lot else to say except that that seems so intuitive. That seems like what we. That's the point of our concept of a disease. That's the point of our concept of a substance. Um, I mean, uh, right from uh, Archimedes with the, the, you know the story of Archimedes? Let me see if I could. Okay, Archimedes. So, um, <laughs> the, the, so this is a long, long time ago. And um, the king was given a crown um, by a hostile neighbor. And uh, if the crown is um, made of real gold, that's an expression of submission um, and should be welcomed. And uh, if the crown is made of um, baser metals, um, then that's an expression of contempt and it's war. Um, but uh, we don't know which it is, and you can't melt it down to, which is the easiest way to find out, because if it's friendly, then that itself would be a declaration of war. Um, yeah, so, so, um, uh, so Archimedes has to think of a new way of finding out whether it's really gold. Yeah. Now, that tells you something about the concept of gold. You can make sense of finding new tests for whether something's gold. So um, if you consider this kind of picture, you've got these characteristic symptoms of whether something's gold. And, and um, Archimedes is looking for a new test. And this is the thing about the bath and the density and all that. Um, but the, the important point is here, here is this S1, S2, that's not a fixed list. Like someone um, trying to find the, um, uh, the diagnosis of a disease might always be looking for new diagnostic indicators of whether someone has the disease. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, if you think about a notion like mud, I mean, I guess they would have had the notion of mud even in, antiqu even in antiquity. E even the Greeks would have had some notion of mud, r right? But nobody in their senses would try to think, would sit in the bath trying to think of a new way of telling whether something is mud. You see what I mean? If, if it looks like mud, then that's it, right? If it, if it fills the muddy roll, then it's mud, right? But gold is not just looking like gold. Yeah, g gold, you think, is something deeper than that. And um, uh, uh, all through the centuries, people have tried to find better tests for whether something is a particular chemical substance. And people have always acknowledged the possibility of ringers. Um, so the, the, the point of these concepts, you know, these concepts right from the word go, right from um, the ancient Greeks, uh, people have thought, I've got these outward indicators of whether something is of this stuff. Um, but that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm trying to get onto here is a kind of stuff. Um, and my outward indicators are only superficial, provisional um, uh, ways of telling whether I've got something there. Yeah. Just as with, we do with diseases. I mean, it's, kind of, it's very obvious with diseases that that's what, what's going on. Yeah. So something like that is the motive for saying the, uh, uh, the, that underlying thing is really fundamental. Uh, last one. Three quick things. OK, right. <laughs> Yes, the, the, the a priori is um, nothing. That's right. That's going to come out true, yeah. Uh, that's right. What I'm saying is, if you know that it's true in the actual world, whichever world is actual, I'll go over this next time, actually, actually, right, possibly. Um, <laughs> I'll go over this next time. But if you know that it's true in the actual world, whatever world is actual, then if you think about uh, going from uh, actual world to actual world, right, then uh, if water, f if, H if XYZ is filling this role here, then Given this world is, is actual, there are going to be these other possible worlds in which H2O is filling that role, but H2O is not water. Yeah? So it always comes out contingent, whichever world is actual, but it also comes out true, whichever world is actual. Yeah, 
That's right. I, I will go over this, uh, but um, really all that's happening here is just what happened with those names like Bright and the inventor of the wheel, Bright for the inventor of the wheel, or whatever it is. We're just having exactly the same discussion here. Um, so just to, I, 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 would, I would like, do I have time? I would like to just r wrap up very quickly. Um, so the question was, do psychological states fix reference? Is what's in your mind fixing the reference of your term? And um, Putnam's argument here is, let's roll back the time to Earth in 1750. Nobody has any idea that water is H2O. But still back then in 1750 on Earth, the word water refers to H2O and not to XYZ. On Twin Earth in 1750, what does the word water refer to? It refers to XYZ. It doesn't refer to H2O. Um, but consider you and your counterpart on Twin Earth. I mean, not you, of course, but your, pre your, your ancestors and your ancestors' counterpart, your ancestor Oscar and your, and your um, counterpart's ancestor Oscar too on Twin Earth back in 1750. So suppose it's Earth in 1750 and Twin Earth in 1750. So you've got Oscar here and Oscar there. Um, are their psychological states the same? Yes, their psychological states are the same. Are they referring to the same stuff? No, they are not referring to the same stuff. Does psychological state therefore fix reference? No, right? Psychological state does not fix reference. Um, so the very same psychological states, given the qualifications we had earlier, they are, as far as it matters, molecule for molecule identical, the so psychological state does not fix reference. Right? Um, uh, that's, yeah, uh, quick, very quickly. Yes. That's right. That's very good. So, um, you, the, 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 the last thought, uh, that's actually the same point I want to d d end on, that after all, what's going on here is that if we switch you between Earth and Twin Earth, the reference of your term is going to change. Yeah? That's part of the story here. But how could you be in the same psychological state if the references of your terms are shifting? I mean, isn't what you're thinking about determined by what the references of your terms are? And isn't the content of your thought, isn't that just part of human psychology? And surely what you're thinking about, if I say to you, well, what are you thinking about? That's an aspect of your psychology I'm asking you about. And if the answer is, well, I'm thinking about H2O, or I'm thinking about XYZ, or whatever it might be, then you're telling me something about your psychological state. So, of course, Putnam's argument seems like it must be right, but then on the other hand, it seems like it must be wrong, if you see what I mean. You see why it must be right? Because the two Oscars have the same psychological state and a different reference. But on the other hand, if they've got a different reference, doesn't that just mean they've got a different psychological state? And you might say, well, actually, we just need a distinction here. There's a psychological state that's inside the head, and there's some broader notion of psychology that includes your relations to your surroundings. Maybe we just need a simple distinction like that. And in those terms, Putnam's point would be the state that was within your head isn't fixing reference. But maybe there's some broader notion of psychology that includes your context. Um, and uh, that's varying from context to, from situation to situation. And maybe that fixes reference. On those bombshells, <laughs> we'll pick up with Putnam again on um, Monday. Okay, thanks.